I cannot believe this crowd. Thank you so much. So um, part, of, part of my bio included the fact that now that I'm retired, my inner night owl is reasserting itself. So I'm typically not here and moving uh, anywhere <laughs> really, this early in the morning. So thank you for all the energy you're bringing in um, here. And I understand that we have quite a number of people on the live stream. So thank you very much for joining us as well. Um, I want to jump right in and I want to talk a little bit about my childhood. So I was obsessed with the future and it stressed me out. I worked really hard in pursuit of good grades. I often talked about or thought about what I would talk about, how I would dress, how I would act, not only at you know special occasions or events, but for almost every single day. And I worried, worried about everything. When I graduated from high school, I was a top tier student, which for me meant when I got to college, I was a pretty average student, maybe even less than average. <laughs> I, I could not believe that I would have to work harder and stress, my, uh, stress myself out even more to be become a top tier student in college. So I quickly decided I was gonna change my perspective to hell with grades. I was going to concentrate on learning the skills that I needed to become a reporter. That was a big weight off my shoulders and I started not being so stressed out. When I started to implement that idea, staying in the present and not worry about the future, um, I relaxed and, and by the time I graduated, I felt, you know, that I was a pretty average person. You know, I could, I, I could <laughs> deal with things a whole lot better. Um, so I did graduate from Cal State Long Beach with a Bachelor of Arts degree in journalism and a really shaky B. Um, and then I went off and worked in news organizations for 11 years. So I feel like, you know, it worked out. Things worked out. Now I want to fast forward to about halfway through my six years as director of publications at Visit Tucson, or which was clunkily known then as the Metropolitan Tucson Convention and Visitors Bureau. <laughs> oh, some people who know that, huh? That's great. Um, a coworker was telling me about the career development workshops that she had been attending and that she was able to figure out a one-year plan and a five-year plan. And she was starting to visualize what the height of her career would look like. I told her I was not that goal-oriented, that I tended to just consider our opportunities as they came up. She was aghast. <laughs> she told me this story that I understand a lot of career development experts tell and that is about Alice in Wonderland, who Alice asks the caterpillar which path she should take to get out of the garden. And the caterpillar says, well, where do you want to end up? Where do you want to go? When Alice says that she doesn't know, the caterpillar snarkily says, well, then it doesn't really matter what path you take, does it? Now, I'm having an existential crisis. <laughs> Like, am I supposed to have goals? <laughs> um, am I aimlessly wandering through my life? Am I being a slacker in the eyes of other people who, who know where they're going? Being a voracious reader and not having a functional internet at the time, now this is the early 90s, I went to Walden Books in the Tucson Mall. Anybody remember Walden Books? Yay! Showing your age like I am. So I wandered about the bookstore looking for something. And I eventually land in the philosophy section. Do you know how many books there are about philosophy? There's ancient philosophy, new age philosophy, eastern philosophy, western philosophy. I'm standing there and I think, you know, I think there's probably an answer for me here. But I am overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. 
So then I decided to make a simple choice. I would pick a skinny book. <laughs> and maybe I could thumb through it and find something. So I picked up this pocket guide. It was probably the smallest book on the shelves. And I didn't even have to thumb through it, really. It just flipped open, and it said, a good traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent upon arriving. Well, holy crap. <laughs> This is how I've been living my life since college. And old, some old wise guy said it was okay. <laughs> so of course I bought the book. It's an English version of the Tao Te Ching, which is a uh, Ch ancient Chinese philosophy. And I've been a student of the Tao ever since. Um, and it, and in reading through this, I realized that I, I actually was practicing the Tao a lot. I just didn't know it until I started becoming a student of it. So what I've done today is I'm, I've brought a couple of, I want to share a couple of bits of imagery about the Tao, which is translated into the way and often expanded as the way of nature. Um, and so these, these two bits of imagery are some of the things that I rely on to live in the Tao, um, including one of the major tenets, which is to live a life of kindness, um, humility, and simplicity. So the first thing I brought is a bowl. This is one of my favorite bowls from our kitchen. Um, the bowl itself is not important. What's important is what you do with the emptiness inside the bowl. So when I'm writing a story, let's say about school funding or critical race theory, or if I'm writing some content like the web page uh, or the home page for a website, I become the emptiness of the bowl. I clear my mind. I listen to people that I'm interviewing, I'm gathering information with no expectations about what I will find and not placing any bias or judgment of the information that I get. I sort of, in my mind, put it in the bowl, do my work, which is writing, and then setting it out. At that point, the work that I've done is not mine. It is for the people who feel that they could use this information. I don't have any expectations as to whether anybody reads it or what they do with it, if they do read it. And I'm not concerned with any consequences um, that may come out from these people reading my stuff. So I do not write for me. I write for the needs of my readers. And that helps me stay focused. This has helped me in developing this practice, this has helped me put together my um, elevator speech, or my motto of my career, and that is that I provide information that people may use to make decisions about their life, and nothing more. Okay, so the next um, bit of uh, visual um, imagery that I want to share with you is The boulder. Okay, I know it's a rock. It's a rock. <laughs> don't judge. Don't judge me. <laughs> but but let's pretend that it is a boulder, about let's say half the size of this stage and all the way up. And let's also imagine that this boulder is sitting in the middle of a flowing river. Let's say the width of this stage and flowing out on either side, right? So things with heartbeats may look at this boulder and say, that's an obstacle to get me to the other side, right? And as a person with a heartbeat, I'm, I personally might look at that and say, I've got to overcome that somehow. I've got to climb up it. 
I've got to break it apart, I've got to knock it down, I've got to figure out a way to get through this. To the water, it is not an obstacle at all. As a matter of fact, the boulder is nothing. It is only part of its path. Thinking that way has helped me in so many different ways in my um, public, private, professional life. But I do want to talk about how it helped me through a couple of really hard times uh, for my business as a contract writer and editor. Um, some of you may have suffered through some of these as well. One was the Great Recession, <laughs> and the other one, of course, was COVID-19. In each of those instances, business just stopped. There was nothing, nothing was happening. Clients stopped calling, contracts got canceled. Um, so at that, in those moments, I could have done things like, I don't know, make decisions that I w didn't want to really make, like get another job or work harder somehow. Um, you know, those kinds of things. But, but that's not me. I'm, I'm not into that. So, <laughs> and so I just, I just became flexible like the water, right? And I looked around, saw what opportunities there would be. And um, so during the Great Recession, I was able to get a gig teaching children how to write, which was quite an experience. I had never done that before, but it was something new. And then during COVID-19, I was able to use my skills on a volunteer basis to help an organization whose community work is vital. And for reals, I did those things and nothing more, just kept it very simple. And as these events ended, passed by, whatever you want to call it, then work came back. Clients called, new contracts were signed. Um, so I was able to keep to how I am and get to the other side to continue on my business. And that's how I was able to keep my business for a quarter of a century. So that was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So 10 years ago, people started asking me to tell my own stories, to share my own experiences. And I thought, well, that's an interesting way to provide information. So I'm going to try it. Um, so I did um, articles, for instance, and interviews about things like how to run a business, how to gain skill sets, um, how to work with clients, that kind of stuff. I also got involved with more formal storytelling to tell my own personal stories and did a few presentations, including one on this very stage. So I'm sort of used to this now. <laughs> My latest gig was uh, for a project called Stories for Change. Um, in it, I, and somebody knows Stories for Change? Yay. Um, <laughs> so I and the other participants were taught how to create three minute videos on our experiences with COVID-19. I brought that today because it illustrates how becoming the emptiness of the bowl and having the flexibility of the river actually helped me put this video together. So I'll discuss that part of it after we show the video, but Jen, if we could go ahead and do that. From the early days of COVID-19, I had more than my health to worry about. I'm writing a journal about this historic time to record the minutia of everyday life. I did not expect that it would become a record of my stress over Asian American hate. I'm a Filipino American. Unfortunately, I'm used to regular harassment and microaggressions. Now I felt threatened. Kung flu, China virus. I instantly knew this rhetoric would make life tough for people like me. And I wasn't the only one who knew. At a grocery store, I struck up a conversation with a Korean American. This stranger summed up what we faced. With COVID, we are all Chinese. My journal is full of instances that this is true. I saw strangers pull up, hesitate, turn around, or give me a wide berth when they saw me. I started thinking they were afraid of me because of my Asian-looking face. 
I was pissed off that racism made me wonder if people were avoiding me. Sometimes I found myself doing the same thing, in a way. I had to pass by a big beefy white guy and a big beefy white teenager. I averted my eyes and hoped they would pass me by and leave me alone. Then I felt guilty that I was following a stereotype and being racist. Then I was mad that I felt that way. My daughter is proudly multicultural. She physically doesn't look Asian. I sadly felt grateful for that. I told her not to publicly mention her Asian American background right now. I felt that will help her avoid any racist confrontations and keep her safe. I do not like that I felt the need for this conversation. But to me, I had no choice. Terrible news kept scaring me. There has been a bit of news about Asian American elderly getting attacked. It's made me want to just stay home. Who needs all that stress? The shootings of Asian American women in Atlanta finally broke me. I cried. I hate this idea that I'm scared, even though it's unlikely I would be harassed or attacked. I'm a little concerned about my mental health over this. Eventually, two Zoom meetings were held for the local Asian American community. At least one official expressed empathy. Tucson City Councilman Steve Kozacic assured us that how AAPI folks are feeling is valid, even if the initial perception of events may be wrong. The Tucson mayor and law enforcement officers also attended, otherwise crickets. From other officials, the media, and the rest of the community, I felt Tucson did not care. I was part of the Asian American pride movement in the 1970s. What went wrong? Well into the 21st century, people are still surprised that Asian American hate exists. I've resolved to again speak up at every single instance of AAPI harassment and hate. I also must do better to find allies so that together we can open people's eyes. The age of COVID revealed to me that this work is far from done. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so I want to address the boulder first. Um, when I was writing this stuff in my journal, I kept thinking that maybe I ought to do something about it. But to be frank, I was too scared, and I was also too tired of having to be a vocal activist again for this issue. So I didn't participate in anything uh, much. And it was only until I, had, I came upon the opportunity to work with Stories for Change that I found an outlet to provide this information. Um, and I'm really glad I did because it allows me to be sure that this part of the COVID-19 story gets told and that it's not lost to history. So I think that was a better situation than trying to um, be an activist that I didn't want to be anymore. So I maintain that flexibility of the water and getting to the other side. As for the emptiness of the bowl, what better way to tell a story than with words that were written in the moment with emotions raw and um, you know not unexamined. And so I used those exact words with just a little bit of content and you may notice that there is no call to action to this because I want people to see the video and then decide themselves what they're going to do. If you don't do anything, that's fine. If you do something, that's great. Um, but it's your choice, just as it was my choice to create this. So thank you. <laughs> So simplicity of action and of thought through Tao has actually made me a much calmer person. Some people might not agree with that, but <laughs> have made me a calmer person and made me open to opportunities as they arise because I have no expectations of how my life is going to go. I'm rooted in the present, so I'm, no, I'm not stressed out about the unknowable future 
and the unchangeable past. I trust my inner nature, the natural world, and maybe even the nature of the universe as I see it for myself. So I continue on my uncharted journey, and I want to thank Creative Mornings Tucson, all of the um, sponsors, all of you here, and all of you in the live stream for allowing us all to share our journeys for a few minutes this morning. So thank you very much.